um, World Wildlife Day is on Sunday, March 3rd. Um, so I took this as an opportunity to kind of just highlight some of the um, amazing diversity that we have within the state of Kentucky, specifically on the wildlife side. Um, you know, that extends to trees, you know, all 120 tree species and, and shrubs and other plants, ephemerals that are about to be popping up and, and awesome to go on those walks here, uh, very short, potentially right now, uh, based on the weather we're having. Um, so, you know, just going to focus a little bit on some of the, the, the wildlife that we have um, and, and many of which you may have never even heard of or knew existed in our state uh, because we have so many of them. Um, so kind of break this down, right? So we have our, our and I, I threw in some, some abnormal things I don't talk about. So go, go be nice to me on questions because they are outside of my expertise. Usually, you know, hand in hand, I'm a wildlife biologist. There's fishery biologists that actually focused on the the ones on the right side of this screen here, uh, but they do fall within the management of Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources. So I wanted to make sure, you know, they're considered wildlife under the definition of non-domesticated vertebrate species um, or invertebrate, depending on, you know, throw the mussels and the snails in there. Um, so, you know, we've got a huge number of species present, well over a thousand um, different species fall within the management of Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources. Uh, so to highlight some of the ones that we have here, oh man, I see an error, um, a typo here. Um, specifically, we have 57 amphibians, primarily made up of salamanders in the state of Kentucky. We are in number two state uh, in the United States in terms of salamander diversity behind North Carolina with 35 different salamander species. And on top of that, we have 22 frog and toad species here in Kentucky. Um, we do not have 248 mammals. Uh, that would be pretty awesome if we did, though. They are the cute and cuddly ones out of this entire bunch, I would say. Um, we are, are much lower than that. That's supposed to read 48. Um, of which, uh, 27 are small mammals and include 16 different bat species identified in the state of Kentucky, and 14 of which are considered permanent residents. Uh, the Brazilian long-tailed bat uh, used is uh, occasional pops in and, and uh, there's some other ones that are kind of intermittently around. Um, we have well over 350 species of birds that will give or take um, uh, make an appearance here in the state, um, including some really odd ones that we recently had, right? So we had the flamingos that were here after the hurricane a couple months ago. Uh, they would not fall into what we would normally say is a bird within Kentucky. Um, but the great thing about birds is they're incredibly mobile. Uh, so you may have some really fun ones that pop in on occasion. Uh, however, most of our birds, we have group into two main categories or three main categories. We have our, our residents, things like cardinals, uh, cedar waxwings, um, red-tailed hawks um, that are here year-round. Uh, then we get into our spring migrants, our neotropical migrants that are about to start showing up, like shown here, which is our Kentucky warbler. So I threw that picture on there as a high layer species. Um, and, you know, many, many other warbler species and, and, and migrants that are going to pop in. Uh, well over 150 species that would fall into this category. Um, and then, um, you know, we get into some of the winter uh, residents that actually are migrating to spend the winter here in Kentucky from the north. Um, and, you know, we see uh, a few species. This, that one's a little bit smaller in number. Uh, however, things like waterfowl is a great example of winter migrants that we see that spend their time uh, in our state uh, to, to basically buy their time until they head back north again. The next group there that I have is our reptiles. We have 56 species uh, present within this group, including 10 lizard species, 32 different snake species, and not all of them are venomous, only four, uh, and then 14 different turtle species. Um, so they're a pretty, um, pretty diverse group. Um, and the species I have pictured here is a mud snake. Uh, it is not a commonly seen species. It's mostly located out in Western uh, Kentucky. Um, in the, the floodplains of the Mississippi. Uh, however, it is a rather large species that, um, you know, you'd have to go searching under, under logs that are partially submerged to find them. Um, but it is a about a four foot long species that has this vibrant, vibrant red belly to it. Um, really interesting and colorful snake. Uh, finally, we get into some of our fish, and this is where I'm getting out of my realm here. Um, we get we have almost 250 fish species within the state of Kentucky, um, and 
about 68 of those, unfortunately, are, spe are identified as spe species of greatest needs for management. Um, we have a huge diverse group of darters, our smaller species. Uh, often we think of things like that muskie that's pictured there or, or walleye or sauger, um, something like that in terms of game species. But the diversity really lies in the little guys, especially those that live in very small uh, streams. Um, you know, specifically things like the Kentucky arrow darter that you'll see later that are, are found in the, just a small area of the state um, that are doing quite well in that area. You're just really kind of endemic to a very small spot. Um, and probably one of the, the most, um, the, the group that brings the most to the table in Kentucky relative to other places here uh, is that last group, the mussels and aquatic snails. Um, we have about 103 species of mussels um, present. Um, Unfortunately, this is also a group that we probably lost a lot of our species. Some may have never even known. Uh, but in this group, there's about 36 that are considered rare or endangered right at this point in time. Uh, and that number is going to be increasing, um, including 27 that are considered threatened or endangered species with two more that are potentially going to be listed. So this is one right with that aquatic environment and, and the potential nutrient loads and alterations from the anthropogenic activities. They took a big hit. Um, and a lot of uh, problems there. Um, the cool thing is that, um, you know, we have the Mussel Lab that's hosted by the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources, as well as partnerships with uh, U.S. Forest Service. Uh, we have some of the world leaders in um, mussel work uh, right here in the state doing some amazing things, trying to, to keep these species around and, and, and conserve them for future generations. Now, the next part. Unfortunately, we have lost a lot of our species present in the state, some completely, others just we lost range restrictions. Um, so probably the most notable from the wildlife perspective that, um, you know, um, with given Audubon's relationship to the state, uh, the passenger pigeon and the long history of, of the passenger pigeon uh, with the Ohio River, Kentucky River, and, and the, how those flocks would just turn the sky black. Um, there are so many of them. They were um, the meat market, unfortunately, took a very big toll on them. They also had a weird um, little behavior where they needed uh, a colony size that was over a certain amount to initiate breeding. Uh, and once that number fell below that, then there was nothing we could do um, to ensure the, the survival of the species. Um, some subspecies that we also lost in the state, including the eastern elk, which we no longer have. So the elk that we have present in the state are actually Rocky Mountain elk. They're not the same animals that existed here um, back in prior to European colonization. Uh, same kind of goes for the eastern cougar, mountain lion. Um, the, you know, that we have a small subspecies that lives and resides down in South Florida, and then we have the western species that is kind of creeping further and further east in the Dakotas and, and um, Nebraska and the Black Hills, uh, and, and Iowa seems to, and Missouri seem to have a lot more frequent uh, visitors from that, those populations, but we, our, our species that was here, our subspecies that was here has been gone for uh, many, many decades. Um, more recently, we, with uh, especially with the speaking of, of um, forest health pests, uh, the pine beetle, uh, we lost the red cockaded woodpecker. It was holding on down in the southern part of our state for all the way up into the 90s. And uh, unfortunately, uh, with the forest structure that they need, we lost that um, due to the, the die off of the several of the pine trees. Um, so they are still alive and well further south. They're not doing great in some places. They seem to be pretty stable, but we do not have them in Kentucky anymore. Um, some larger species like the bison that were huge drivers of our ecosystems, especially here in the bluegrass, um, we no longer have present either uh, as much of their range has shrunk, right? So there's only very few places where you have free ranging uh, bison anymore. Um, some other bird species that are lost completely. Um, historically, we probably had the ivory bill woodpecker, especially out further west in part of the state uh, in the um, cypress swamps. Um, the Carolina parakeet, um, greater uh, prairie chicken was also located in, this, in um, parts of the state that were originally prairie. We lost a lot of our prairie areas. Um, and then getting into this, you know, swallow kite, uh, a swallowtail kite, um, and then uh, several other mussels that we lost, like the yellow blossom, the winged maple leaf. So unfortunately, we would have been more diverse, as are most places. Uh, however, you know, we're still doing pretty good. Um, and a lot of that is actually, you know, 
being managed and, and maintained because of the, the mantra that wildlife biologists have, build it and they will come, field of dreams, right? Um, it, you know, all those activities are really under the, this idea that um, these species require habitat. And if you create and manage that habitat, um, especially in the altered landscape that we live in, an active management um, mentality is needed that, you know, we're trying to make sure there's habitat presence to support these species so that they're around for future generations to enjoy. A lot of our previous work has, has been spent trying to prioritize individual species um, that still occurs, especially with our threatened and endangered species that are listed. However, um, there's been a, a paradigm shift where we've really started focusing on trying to work on ecosystem health, ecosystem connectivity, um, using umbrella species to help achieve those goals. Uh, ideally, those umbrella species are usually more charismatic and can reach landowners to help them um, kind of engage with the idea of needing these species around, and then it also benefits a lot of others. Um, one of the specific ones that we use uh, a lot for grasslands are bobwhite quail. Uh, it's a great umbrella species for grassland birds. It's not perfect, but it helps uh, promote habitat conditions that favor a lot of species um, that are declining because of habitat loss and the loss of grasslands. Uh, and early successional habitat in general. So that's kind of where we are moving in terms of trying to make sure we have a lot of these species around in, in the future. Um, and there's a lot of active habitat management that goes on and that takes a wide variety of forms from fire uh, to herbicides, to, to logging, um, to, you know, um, you know, even farming practices in some extents, uh, grazing practices uh, that help maintain early successional habitat. And, you know, one of the, the, you know, not being a native Kentuckian, uh, being from Pennsylvania, one of the things that I, I find really amazing about this state is um, the reason we have so many species. You know, why do we have so many species in the state of Kentucky? Well, it comes to the fact that there's so much going on in our state from east to west um, in terms of topography, uh, in terms of, you know, the eco regions that we have the, uh, that allow for different um, habitat structure, plant diversity, uh, the soil types, all of that plays a role where we got, have a huge diversity of habitats, which equals a diversity of species that resides in, reside in them. Um, so I kind of wanted to take this, this you know, chance to, to walk us through some of those uh, habitat types that are really kind of unique, um, that you'll find only certain species within them, uh, to try to highlight, you know, basically parts of our state that have wonderful things going on in terms of the, the wildlife world. We'll start off initially with right here centrally located and where we're at right now as we do this show, the bluegrass region. And, um, you know, this is probably one of the most, um, all in general, the most heavily altered landscapes. Uh, so we see um, many of the species that would have been here uh, prior to European um, colonization and development as we move along, industrial revolution, all that. Um, so we would have had a lot of savannas and actually we would have had a lot of cane breaks uh, present along our riparian areas, so much so that they could have been three to five miles wide off of, of our, our stream systems. Um, and, um, you know, that in itself is, you know, our native cane has really gone away. There's some remnants in certain places. So we lost a lot of the species that were there. Uh, we would probably have things like swamp rabbits, even all the way up in our bluegrass region. A lot of the savannas were going to be maintained by the bison that were here. Um, so now we have a lot of species that do quite well in um, agricultural or human dominated landscapes. Uh, these ones are generally um, early successional species that live in brushy areas in and around developments, uh, as well as those that are kind of more generalist, um, things like the garter snake, uh, the snapping turtle that can kind of deal with a lot of human activity and, and, and still have success. You know, I have the eastern towhee is present here. It's one of my favorite shrub and birds, and it's one that I see on a fairly regular basis, even in, in landscapes. Um, and, you know, that holds true, which, you know, a lot of our, our landscape isn't that savanna. It's not the patchy habitat. It's a lot more of, of um, you know, horse farms, uh, human developments, and these are the species that we see there, right? So robins are doing wonderful. Um, they do quite well in, in um, lawn dominated landscapes uh, with one or two places to nest around. They succeed. Um, other species like the gray rat snake or black rat snake do great. Uh, and then we have the ones, uh, you know, that maybe we don't want to succeed so well, but they're, they're doing it. Um, things like the, the striped skunk. Uh, which, by the way, you probably are noticing that there's quite a few of them hit on the road right now. It is 
um, striped skunk mating season. So they're out and about looking for love. Valentine's Day kicks in, it, it gives them a bug. Um, and then we also have, you know, a raccoon who can pretty much live anywhere there's a trash can and they know how to get into it, even if you lock it down. Um, so they're, they're obviously one of the ones that does really well in human dominated landscapes. Moving on kind of down, down the interstate a little bit, we get into one of the most, you know, I, diverse areas, um, especially as it relates to aquatic diversity and mussel diversity with South Central Kentucky, the Green River. Um, in this area, we have a very karst kind of geology, um, which presents uh, its own little landscape of uh, pop-up springs and caves um, that promotes a lot of birds. There's been a lot of conservation activity down there. Uh, as it relates to the CREP program, uh, early 2000s and, and up till, you know, uh, about five years ago, that program really brought about a lot of grassland conservation, the bobwhite quail, many grassland birds have responded quite well to those areas. A uh, huge amount of mussel diversity within the river itself. There's also a lot of bats uh, that use that area. Um, specifically, the gray bat is down there. Uh, that's uh, not as common in the rest of the state, but it has a pretty good breeding stronghold in that region. Um, and there's a lot more other conservation activities kind of keep these going on, um, even including acts of Congress to remove dams. Uh, work uh, spearheaded by several groups, but TNC has done a lot of work down there to try to promote that biodiversity conservation because it's such an important area. Um, and, you know, in general, that that cave mentality and all that it bring, or cave presence and karst uh, geology is, is really neat and it allows a lot of different species to succeed down there, along with making a really cool tour to go out and check it out and go look for those wildlife uh, and go see some really neat stuff while you're at it. Mammoth Cave and that area is a wonderful day spent to go enjoy wildlife on March 3rd if you can. Uh, other cool areas that are um, a little bit smaller in size relative to the rest of the state is far western Kentucky. And this is getting into the Mississippi Alluvial Valley. Um, so I'm talking cypress swamps right along the Mississippi River there and, and a few of those feeder streams that go into it. So far, far west Kentucky, it kind of that Mississippi Alluvial Valley comes up all the way from, from the, the Gulf Coast there. And it produces a very specific type of habitat structure, floodplain. Um, kind of, of, of situation that has really uh, interesting wildlife call it home. This is the area you're going to see the most waterfowl in the state of Kentucky and the most diverse number of species because of that flooding um, system in terms of uh, the food opportunities it presents within wetlands that are created, uh, as well as the fact that it kind of is right at the line where freeze happens on the waterway. So the, the birds come down, that's kind of in, in many years, that's the line that they get to in terms of making it through winter. That's as far south as they have to go. Uh, other animals that are out there that you don't see in other places, it has now become the stronghold, that part of the state has become the stronghold for armadillo um, uh, immigration into the north. Um, they have had a pretty good stronghold of, of that species for a while now. And if you drive around out there in the summer, uh, especially the further west you go, left, uh, you know, west of the uh, land between lakes, you will see armadillos hit on the side of the road pretty regularly. Um, there's also a lot of snake species and amphibians that are out there that you will not see um, in most other parts of the state, including several different um, water snakes uh, that we do not see um, anywhere else. Right next to it, and it kind of transitions nicely um, away from the Mississippi Alluvial Valley, but still staying in this bottomland hardwood forest ecosystem uh, where you have no topography, you get a lot of flooding near the riparian areas, the, the, the stream systems. Um, this presents uh, some a really uh, neat habitat type that allows uh, very specific wildlife to take advantage of it. Things that we see here that we don't see um, at, at least at the densities that we see out in Western Kentucky uh, are things like the prothonotary warbler. There's a few others that are, are, are higher densities. Uh, we have prothonotaries here throughout the state. You just see them more frequently out there because that, that flooded habitat is just more abundant with the, the lack of topography. Um, the lesser siren is found out that way and further west into the Mississippi Luvia Valley. Uh, we have the swamp rabbit that still has a stronghold in this bottomland hardwood system. Uh, that is the rabbit that did attack Jimmy Carter uh, on a boat um, during uh, his little uh, adventure one day on holiday. 
Um, so they are they are a um, species that uses the flooded area of the hard of the forest to evade predators. So they go swimming to avoid their prey instead of just running around in circles like the eastern cottontail does, um, the one that we see here in our backyards. Uh, this is also kind of the, the edge of the range for the cottonmouth. Uh, it, it does come a little further east, um, but uh, for the most part, you're talking about Owensboro, Henderson, County, and west is where you'll see them in terms of snakes. Transitioning east to, to the things that we generally talk about a lot more because there's a lot more forest there. Um, however, uh, also really cool, we get into the Appalachian Mountains. Um, and many of the species and topography that comes with that. Um, and there's a lot there. We think more of our charismatic um, large mammals are on this side, right? Um, so things like the, our, our restored elk population, our black bears. Um, but we also see a lot of bird species on this side of the state that you will not see in other places. This is the, the location where we have things like the gold-winged warbler um, at high altitude, uh, high altitude being for Kentucky. Um, we also see a lot more diversity of our salamanders over here because of the small watersheds that exist that uh, potentially uh, cause isolation and, and then evolution into individual species. Um, there's a, I, I kind of flew through some bigger regions here, but there's a lot more out there. Um, I just encourage you as, as the nice weather um, kicks in, Get out there, you know, go explore, go see more uh, wildlife, go experience these species for yourself. Um, we have a diverse number of ecosystems present in the state. You can find something to see um, regardless where you go. Even, you know, we've got a bird feeder outside our building right here, and there's some birds that um, I get excited to see even now. Um, so, you know, use, use what you have, go out, enjoy, enjoy the diversity that we have, get to those eco regions, go for a nice hike. Um, take in some of the, the, the great joys of natural resources we have here in the state of Kentucky. Um, I kind of highlight several species. There's some that are great restoration uh, stories, um, including things like the peregrine falcon picture here. Uh, I kind of touched on the, the Kentucky darter already. Um, but, you know, there's others that are not doing so great. Our bat species are, are very much in decline. And then our eastern hellbender, which is our largest salamander, is really not doing good. Uh, across its entire range. Um, so to, to some extent, you know, we've got a huge diversity of species, but we got a lot of work to do to make sure that we maintain that diversity moving forward. And every little bit helps. Um, you know, as Franny said, don't, you know, battle those invasives. They don't help, um, you know, do some habitat work in terms of promoting native, native systems, uh, native ecosystems, get some natives in your yard even. That has a big effect on um, even, you know, our migratory songbirds. I went out to my garden the other day and looked at all my cone flowers, and there's not a single seed left on my cone flowers because the finches took care of all of them. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to transition to something real quick, and Renee and Billy may get mad at me, but it's all related to wildlife and managing wildlife. And that's the fact that it's warming up, baby season's coming, and um, there's a few uh, things you know that we want to make sure we emphasize here. Keep the, the wild and wildlife right? Um, so make sure that as you potentially encounter um, new wildlife, newborn wildlife species, babies, wildlife, uh, that you really remember that, you know, many, many species um, kind of have different plans for how they want their babies to survive and how the babies act in order to help them survive, whether that's fawns where they hide and don't move, um, or it could be things like rabbits that are left alone all but for one at one moment of the day. Mom runs in, feeds them, and runs away. Um, or it could be fledgling birds that pop out of a nest that you think should still be in a nest, but they don't, and they know better. Um, so remember that, you know, the best thing you can do is leave wildlife be and let them sort it out for themselves. If you really, really feel like you need to, to, to contact someone to, to ask questions, um, there are resources out there, including um, an entire list uh, set up by Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources for wildlife rehab facilities that all have to kind of be um, regulated. Um, if you go to the website um, on Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources, they have a list of the rehabbers that, that exist, where they are and what they specialize in, uh, and as well as contact information. Um, but remember that wild does, you know, wildlife belong in the wild. Um, and there's many regulatory um, statutes that uh, confirm that lawfully. 
um, including, you know, uh, those associated with transporting and holding of wildlife. There's also local governments that have been empowered to, to make their own regulations, um, especially those related to rabies vectors. We do not want to be dealing with um, species that carry rabies, moving species around, and in general don't want to move species around because of, of the diseases that they carry and potential harm that causes for public health. 